welcome to Retro Bassin. A few months ago, I had my first experience with the Charlie Brewer slider system when we took it on a couple of different apartment ponds outside of Houston. Suffice to say, I didn't know what the heck I was doing and I definitely was fishing probably the entire system completely wrong. Since then, I have um, made a few investments in the Charlie Brewer system, including uh, Charlie Brewer's book, specifically on the topic, a Charlie Brewer slider rod <laughs> with an old school Mitchell 308A reel, and of course, enough slider worms to choke every bass in Lady Bird Lake. So today on Retro Bassin, I'm going to be going through some of my favorite tips that I got from Charlie Brewer's book on slider fishing. Stick around. Retro Bassin, kicking some ass and wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40-year-old lures. Coming off of Zepco 33 Out on the bass boat making beer cans float Doing some trespassing Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules Welcome to Retro Bassin The first lesson I learned about the Charlie Brewer slider system was the philosophy behind the do-nothing bait. Charlie, being an avid angler in Tennessee, spent a lot of time watching bait fish behavior. And there's nothing a bass loves to eat more than a little minnow. And what Charlie noticed is that the way the minnows swim, they don't necessarily jerk around very erratically and make a ton of movement. In fact, they sort of just slide up and down the water column, very gracefully, very methodically. That is especially true for a little bait fish swimming around unaware that a big old bass wants to eat it. So, for that reason, Charlie designed the slider worm, and this is a beautiful little four inch worm that has very few features. There's no appendages, no ribbon tail, nothing crazy going on. Just a very subtle little bait. I'm sure one of the first things a lot of bass anglers thought about the do nothing technique is why would a bass hit a lure with no action because a lure with no action must not look alive. And to prove them wrong, Charlie had a great little tip. He would take a slider worm like this, say hold the worm by its head, and try to hold the worm as best you can, as still as possible. And even if you're trying to hold that worm super, super still, just the natural movement of your body imparts just a little bit of action into that worm. That's exactly what Charlie Brewer was talking about. The do-nothing worm, it's called do-nothing, but in fact, it's got a lot of action. Now to take that principle one step further, Charlie advised tying a slider worm onto your slider rod, hold the rod out as, again, still as possible, and seeing if you can keep that worm still. So I will show this for you right now, and you can see that it is basically impossible to keep that slider worm still. I am doing the best I can not to move it, but uh, I've had two cups of coffee and I'm shaking that rod like crazy. And look at that. That little slider worm is still moving. Even though the technique is to impart as little action into the lure as possible, there's no way to eliminate all action. And what we end up with is a very subtle, very glidey bait. So the next thing Charlie addresses with the slider fishing system is the cadence of the retrieve. And in his book on slider fishing, Charlie said something, that, honestly, that I'd never really heard of before, but as I think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And what he said is that rhythm matters. And consistent rhythm really is a trigger for bass. He doesn't mean that the lure should be devoid of any erratic motion or action, but what he means is the speed with which that lure, from the time it hits the water to the time you pull it out of the water, that speed 
or rhythm should be consistent. To illustrate his theories, Charlie often points back to the natural world, and his comment is that a minnow, unless it's being chased, doesn't suddenly change its speed as it's swimming along, especially in a short area. Minnows either go like this, or they go like this, but they don't change. And I don't know how many times you guys have done this, but I am definitely guilty of changing the rhythm as I reel in. I might get 15 foot in with a slow retrieve. Maybe I'll speed it up a little bit. Maybe I'll slow it down. I historically am not really that good with keeping rhythm. And it makes sense on those casts when I do that. It's generally because I'm getting antsy and I very rarely actually get a fish while doing that. So, to actually keep the same rhythm, Charlie is really big on timing your retrieve. And he's got a couple of different metrics in there for how fast to retrieve. But, you know, one of them would be, for example, one real turn every three seconds. If you start your cast like that, finish your cast with that same retrieve speed. Perhaps it is one turn every six seconds. Again, if you start here, finish there. So I'm going to practice that. I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can see, but I'm gonna start out with a pretty standard slider retrieve of one real turn every three seconds, and we'll see if that works. What I'm gonna do here is reel this one real turn every three seconds, or at least as best I can. Really hard to do. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Three, one thousand. Oh man, this is really slow. And notice that I'm not imparting, oh, I just sped up, any additional action. I'm just slowly reeling in every three seconds. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. While I think Charlie's preferred and original technique for fish the slider worm was to use the reel itself to bring that lure in at a consistent rhythm, there are definitely some alternatives to the slider retrieve that I've learned from the book and they might be a little bit more in line with traditional worming techniques. The first is called polishing the rocks and in that what we're doing is actually fishing the worm on the rod tip, slowly inching it along so that that slider stays in contact with the bottom, but inches along ever so slowly. And for impatient fishermen like myself, he also has a technique called the pull and drop, which is probably more consistent with the standard worm retrieve that most folks employ today. I see a few rocks here, so we're gonna try to do a little polish in the rocks right now. So I've got to admit, this feels much more natural to me, probably because for my entire bass fishing career, this is how I have worked in soft plastics. But I don't know that I ever fished it so slow that I could say that I was polishing the rocks. So that is definitely a takeaway from the book. Now we're gonna go ahead and employ that pull and drop technique, and I'm sure that's gonna feel even more natural to me. Suffice to say, this do-nothing worm is definitely doing something with this kind of retrieve. Let's talk about rod position and rod action for a moment. Charlie recommended that when you're reeling in the slider worm, hold your rod just at about a 10 o'clock position. This is the ideal position to have that slider just sort of glide over the top of the bottom or rocks, but it's also a pretty good angle for a hook set. As far as the rod action, and this definitely falls in line with the slider fishing philosophy, hold the rod as still as you can and don't impart any jerks or twitches into the rod. Again, we've got to have faith that that do-nothing worm is actually doing something down there, 
but we don't want it to suddenly jerk or twitch and thus look unnatural. One of the interesting things about this system is that you have a direct connection to the lure the entire length of the cast. Unlike a traditional soft plastic setup where it's a mix of slack line and taunt line, this is consistent start to finish. As such, you definitely can feel every pebble down there as the slider worm glides over top of them, and you definitely feel every tick from a fish. As far as fish striking the bait, the slider worm is definitely not a grip it and rip it kind of deal. For one, because this bait is small and really finessey, it gets hits from a lot of fish, not just target species. And you don't wanna be jerking this thing unnaturally every time a bluegill hits it. Secondly, the hook on this is very light. The line is very light. If you were to do the old bill dance on a slider worm, chances are you'd break your line really quickly. Like always, Charlie has a really good analogy to illustrate this principle. And imagine if you were to tie this line to something heavy, a 10 pound weight. If you were to suddenly just snap that rod as hard as you could, chances are you're gonna snap that eight pound test line. But if you slowly pull it, if you let the rod take the load, then you can actually pull a much heavier weight. So what you're supposed to do is just reel it along. If you feel anything unusual, don't worry, don't stop, just keep reeling. A bass, when it hits it, will definitely take the bait, most likely not run quickly, it'll most likely that line will start moving very methodically, and that's how you know you've got a fish. At that point, what Charlie advises is to reel down slowly lift that rod tip and that hook will usually set right in the top of the fish's mouth. One of the questions I always have whenever I'm fishing deep water with a bottom bouncing bait like a plastic worm is just how long it's going to take that bait to reach the bottom. Especially when using lighter baits sometimes when it actually touches down or if the bottom's a little bit soft or there's some vegetation you may not have that instant gratification of a plink when that lure touches down. Charlie had a really interesting section on just that topic of slider sink rates, and he did a little test, which I think the results are very interesting. He took an eighth ounce slider worm and cast it out into 20 feet of water and timed how long that bait took to sink down. What he found was that on average, an eighth of an ounce rigged slider worm will sink at one foot per second. Not too much of a surprise, but what is interesting is when he actually cut the size of that lead head in half, so it was like a sixteenth ounce, the time till it hit bottom in 20 feet only went up by four seconds. I think what that means is even in situations where you're using a much lighter bait, like the one sixteenth ounce slider that I'm fishing, the sink rate doesn't vary all that much. There's probably no more contested topic when it comes to lure selection than color. Whether or not uh, colors make all the difference or any difference has been debated probably for as long as a man has been fishing. Probably shouldn't surprise anybody that I have a, a pretty generous selection of different slider colors trying to cover every condition that at least I think these colors would be good for. However, in his book, Charlie Sr. has a rather interesting and I've got to say pretty humble approach to color. So I will uh, pull this book again and here's what Charlie Sr. says about whether or not worm colors make a difference. Do worm colors make a difference? To be perfectly frank, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm sure that it does. However, I would like to quote a good friend of mine, Bill Westmoreland. Uh, in an interview, Billy was asked, what do you think about worm colors? Billy's answer was, I think colors are good for fishermen. It gives them confidence. And really when it comes to color selection, that C word is so important for Charlie Brewer Sr. He references different times of his fishing career when he had a ton of confidence in one color. 
And what happens when you have confidence in one color? You probably throw it more often. And what happens when you throw a particular color more often? You're gonna catch more fish on it. But just as much as he had confidence in certain colors over the years, that changed. And I think probably his perspective on worm color changed. So does worm color matter? Well, you know what? I think it matters to the confidence of the fisherman using them. And in that case, it matters very much. Unfortunately, Ladybird Lake turned into a little bit of a dog show, so I had to head out of there fishless. But on my way home, I did stop at one little micro pond that I've been meaning to fish for a while now to see if we can at least get a fish or two on the old school slider. Oh, I got something. I think I got a fish. Maybe a fish. I don't know. <laughs> it's a big ball of weeds, whatever it is. <laughs> what did I get? I think we just caught a new species of fish for me on old retro bassin. Uh, that is definitely... What the heck is that? <laughs> so that looks like a... Is that like a Rio Grande cichlid? That's wild looking. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, that is a pretty looking little panfish. That is 100% not a bluegill. Uh, that has got sort of a cichlid looking tail to it. And I wonder if this is the reason I was getting so many strikes and misses with this. If you've got fish like this with these little bitty mouth, big mouth for panfish, but small for a, a bass, that might have been it. Uh, that's a good looking little fish. Oh my goodness, that's really cool. And uh, a new species for sure. <laughs> so overall, I think that is a great example of what Charlie Brewer Sr. was talking about when he talks about the slider system increasing activity. While this is a little bit frustrating to get a ton of hits, uh, I've got a feeling I'm gonna get more dialed in as to what are the panfish hits and what are the largemouth bass hits. Uh, but either way, <laughs> oh man, thank you, Mr. Charlie Brewer. There's one, another fish. Let's keep him up and in. Come on, buddy. <laughs> oh, look at that. There's another one, a little bit less muddy. Oh man. Got one. I don't know what it is. <laughs> He's in the weeds. Come on up, buddy. <laughs> All right. Got another fish. And by the way, since last cast and this cast, I got online and looked this thing up. This is a green sunfish, a species of fish that I've never, ever seen before, much less caught. <laughs> aggressive, aggressive little suckers. Good looking fish, definitely a bigger mouth than most panfish. And apparently this little pond is chock full of these dudes. Wow, look how pretty he is. Another thing that I'm getting a little bit better at is casting with this rod. I fish a lot of really short rods, but this is definitely one of the more stout and short rods that I've ever thrown. And to be honest, it probably took me the better part of the day to get proficient at casting it. Just loading up on the lure, getting it where I wanted to. And I'm not sure if it's a function of the reel, the rod, or both. But it definitely took a little bit of learning. But now that I've got that dialed in, I can hit every little pocket of this pond that I want. Like that one. <laughs> oh, it's so weird to see these fish hit 
and they go right into those weeds. Oh man, <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Holy mackerel. That's uh, one pound of fish and two pound of weeds there. Another glorious looking little green sunfish. I gotta tell you, I had no idea that these things would be going for the slider worm as hard as they are. I don't know if they're hungry in here, but literally every probably third cast, I'm getting a hit from one of these guys. And I'm not landing them that often, but honestly that I've got four of these things so far on a four inch worm and a big old three odd hook, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> oh my goodness, these guys bury right down in the weeds, okay. <laughs> well, finally adhering to some of Charlie Brewer's lessons, I managed to catch just a little largemouth bass. Not as big as some of the fish we saw at Ladybird Lake, but at this uh, inning of the game, I will take it. Ooh, it looks like he's been bit, by the way. Look at his back. Looks like uh, maybe that blue heron over there took a swipe at him. Thank you, Mr. Charlie Brewer. Suffice to say, I still have a lot to learn about utilizing the slider fishing system. But even fishing this system hardcore for one day, I feel like my confidence in the approach has at least doubled. If you're looking for some more old school fishing content, click right here. Otherwise, I'll see y'all next Saturday. But until then, keep the carpet side up and definitely fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bastards.